for them myself so it was a, a good opportunity to try them so it's really really yeah. nice and tonight it's exciting because the whiskey trail is not something we do a lot of so it would be mm -hmm. fun to do something a little bit different oh perfect yeah doing the same thing over and over again i'm sure just so repetitive right yeah i haven't tried any of these honestly so i'm really interested in learning oh. more about them and tasting them and nice yeah, yeah. Yeah, and for me, I start vacation tomorrow, so this is perfect, oh, perfect yeah. way to start. <laughs> perfect. Yeah, so thank you. You're very welcome. Okay. So we are live on Facebook. I'm going to start letting everybody in. Okay. And um, I'm just going to mute everyone here um, so that, you know, people, we, we maintain a um, cohesive session. So Julie and uh, Lily, you guys will be able to uh, unmute yourselves at will. Um, but uh, we've got people filing in. So good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, we'll get going in a couple of minutes. We're just, uh, um, we've still got people trickling into tonight's feed. And we will get started right away here because uh, our special guests are joining us live from Scotland. And it is a little after midnight there now. So we don't want to keep them up too, too late. Um, Phil and Suzanne out in Ontario have already found the uh, chat feature. So uh, this is probably a good time to mention to everyone, please put your comments, questions, tasting notes into the chat. Um, audio for most participants will be disabled throughout the tasting. And the reason for that is my attention deficit disorder. I gotta keep, keep things under control, not get distracted. Um, also, you know, we want our, our hosts to be well, our guests, special guests to be well heard here during tonight's tasting. So we've got about 46 so far logged in. We're expecting a few more. So we'll give it another minute or two. Um, but what I will do, and I'll type this out for the chat as well. I'll give you all the order we're going to pour things in if you want to get your little sample bottles um, lined up. We're going to start with the Glen Elgin. Uh, we're going to move on to the Cambus, then the Ben Nevis, Invergordon, Glen Rothis, and then the young Ardmore followed by the older Ardmore. Um, so that'll be our range tonight. Uh, while we are waiting for a handful more people to start, I wanna just give a quick shout out um, to another tasting we have coming up on Wednesday, I think July 30th. I'm just pulling up our tasting schedule here. Um, no, sorry, Tuesday, Wednesday, I believe is sold out. Um, coming up on Tuesday, June 29th, there are still seven spots left for our Shelter Point tasting. Uh, Leon Webb, the distillery manager, or sorry, uh, Jacob Weeb, the distillery manager is gonna be joining us live uh, from the distillery. Um, I'll just put the link into the chat for anyone who's not familiar with where to find all of our tastings. So that'll be there for you. And actually I was wrong. There's one spot left for two brewers on Wednesday. Uh, June 30th. Both of those tastings are just $25, which is a great deal. Both of them feature a couple of uh, uh, small Canadian distilleries that we think are doing a great job and are really interesting and worthy of some special notice. And Thursday's Canada Day, so when better to, to celebrate and highlight a couple of Canadian distilleries than on uh, Canada's birthday week, as it were. Um, and I just noticed that Chelsea who is another one of our KWM team has just joined us. So I'm going to uh, give her some co-hosting abilities and allow her to unmute herself and say hi at some point here too. But I think we'll get going because it's a little after uh, a little after five here now in Alberta, a little after midnight in the UK. And uh, we should say hello and welcome our guests. So we are thrilled to be joined live from Glasgow tonight or tomorrow morning in Julie's case uh, by Julie Hamilton. And then we've also got uh, Lily from uh, Edinburgh. Um, Julie is the global brand ambassador for the Elixir Distillers brands. And Lily is a sales manager um, with uh, responsibilities for places like Canada. And we're really lucky to have them both with us tonight, joining us for this tasting. Ladies, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for having us. Nice to be here. Yes, absolutely. So that's <laughs> Early start for everyone, 5 p.m. maybe on a Friday. That's a good way to end the week, I think. It, it is. And here's the thing that's kind of interesting. Um, just quickly scanning the list. I mean, we've got, we're in Calgary. We've got people in Toronto. Um, we've got some people in Vancouver. There's Lethbridge I saw signed on here too. I could do a full list Victoria, 
there's probably people as far east as uh, Quebec or even the Maritimes, which are as far from us as Moscow is from you. So we've got people from probably four time, four to five time zones on tonight's tasting tonight. Actually six, because we've got two in the UK. <laughs> My goodness, that's quite something. Well, hi everybody. Um, uh, as Andrew said, I'm Julie Hamilton. I'm the Global Brand Ambassador for Elixir Distillers. Um, tonight we are going to be taking you through seven whiskies from our whiskey trail range. Um, I will not make you wait to start the first whiskey. I'll talk about <laughs> everything as we go along, but personally, I think there's nothing worse than it all sitting in front of you and you can smell it and you're not, you're not able to start. So, drum number one that we're going to have tonight is from Glen Elgin Distillery. So this whiskey that we're going to taste is 12 years old. It is 56.4% and it's from a, a single hogshead. Um, this is, oh. <laughs> can you see the screen? Yeah, we can. Yeah, so this is uh, the stick here. So um, the, we've got some tasting notes in there as well, if you, if you can, everyone can see that. Um, but yeah, Glen Elgin Distillery um, is, it's a Diageo owned distillery and it is, sits right in the heart of Speyside. So that's it there. Not a terribly pretty distillery, Glen Elgin, but still. Not so much. That's the yeah. prettiest picture I could find, believe it or not. <laughs> I, I didn't know that Glen Elgin had worm tubs. I've, I've learned something just from this not so pretty picture. So that's good. Interestingly. And, and Julie has a very fun fact about the worm tubs as well, I think. They very interesting, we have freshwater shrimp that thrive in their worm tubs as well. So there you go, there's interesting facts about Glen Elgin before we started. So um, <laughs> the, whiskey, the whiskey trail label that, that we're drinking um, tonight, this is uh, a range of whiskies that we have. So Elixir Distillers, we are an independent bottler. We are, there is the parent company that we have is called Speciality Brand, uh, Speciality Drinks, sorry. Um, Please do bear with me. The midnight thing kicks in after a while and I get my words mixed up. But um, Speciality Drinks, they own, um, among other things, the Whiskey Exchange, but Elixir Distillers is the independent bottling leg of that company. And we started in 2002. We, um, the Whiskey Exchange actually started in 1999. So Sukinder and Rajbir Singh are two brothers and they come from a family who owned uh, a shop in North London and it was a very successful booze shop. By the time their parents retired, they decided that they were going to change direction and they decided to, to go with the internet. In 1999, if people can remember what they were doing in 99, they weren't doing very much on the internet at that time. So, and like they weren't working for a fast, you know, fast developing company, but- um, I, I I think that was around the time that pets.com boomed and then busted uh, very abruptly. <laughs> it's, it was quite a jump, you know, it was quite quite a jump to do from an in-person store to, to move into online, but they got someone to build a website for them and started very small and they just had one unit, not very many, it was the two brothers and their two wives and they built to now be the biggest online retailer in the world. So from, from small beginnings, it's a, it's a pretty big company now. In 2002, Sukinder had been bottling his own casks for the Whiskey Exchange and he decided to start his own label. And with a cask, single cask of Tomatin, he started the Single Malts of Scotland. So for anyone who, who was on the tasting last week, you were sampling um, from the Single Malts of Scotland range. In 2008, we had um, the Elements of Isla range begin, which was bottles that are, uh, we bottled whiskies from every Isla distillery in all different shapes and forms. Different, um, sometimes it's batches, sometimes it's single casts, all different cast types, just interesting Isla whiskey. We have Porta Skeg, which and my lovely assistant, Mr. Ferguson here is 
donning a t-shirt tonight. Um, Fortis Gig was um, was born in um, 2009. And then the one that we're doing tonight is a relatively new label. So this is predominantly for us, a label that we don't do very much because it's for our export market. So when we're talking at shows in the UK and things like that, we're, we've not got an, an awful lot of Whiskey Trail. There are some um, that go through the Whiskey Exchange, but for the best part, this is our export label. And with Whiskey Trail, so Single Malts of Scotland, the, the direction that it takes is that it's distillery, classic distillery character that you're getting from, from the whiskies. Elements of Isla, it's, you know, it's just really interesting Isla whiskey. Portaskeg is very gentle, delicate, nuanced um, side of Isla whiskey. And then Whiskey Trio is where we get to have lots of fun because there's no set rules. And we have a variety of different labels and different releases and all the rest of it. So I'll go on to talk about the one that you're drinking now. See, you would have had no whiskey, no, no drinking whiskey if I had, if I just started this now. So we're better to be drumming. So yeah, 12 years old. Um, this one was, it was distilled in 2007. So it had more than 12 years in, in a single hogshead. And we produced 264 bottles of this. So single casks are by their very nature, small amounts. So they are, um, they are limited when, when you see them, when you see them in stores, they're definitely ones to pick up. But this range was the vintage cars range that we had. Um, I don't know if you can put that bottle shot back up again, Lily. Um, but the uh, yeah the labels so the labels are very art deco on these ones. And if we can get the, I always when someone else is doing the presentation, I try and. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard it's hard to get your mouse to to do things functioning on the presentation, but um, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, Lily, I think if you do slideshow from beginning or slideshow from current slide, it should allow you to make that a little larger. I don't know why it's... Here, I might be able to find something. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Um, I'm not sure why my computer is playing. I, I learned this the hard way a couple nights ago when I was trying yeah. to use a second monitor and share screen for the first time and it just ah. did not, it just did not make my life any easier. It doesn't always work. What do you see right now? We can um, see the controls. Ah, okay. That's, that's okay. <laughs> see if you, if you take your screen down, I can show the, the label of the. Yeah. Thank you. So, and wonderfully, I've started on the screen. Sorry. <laughs> oh, we're not doing well, are we? There we go. Oh, we're doing, well, we've got a glass of whiskey in front of us. Well, That's seven it. That's all we in need. front of us. We're doing fine. That's all you need. Here we go. So, this is the label I was after. So, Glen Elgin. So, you can see the, the quite quirky labels we have. So, we've had, um, we were talking about it just before everyone came on there. Um, the we've had lots of different styles of label, but these ones are quite cool. Our um, creative director just gets to have lots of fun with whiskey trail labels, and they are genuinely one of my favourite things. Um, and and do so we know what what beautiful body of water we're looking at with the boats just bobbing in the water? I don't think so. I'm not hundred. <laughs> I doubt it. Although probably if he was here, he would be able to tell us because I'm quite sure that there is, and there's a huge amount of thought process goes into this. Actually, there's not this one, but I know that the blended Isla malt in that series was Monte Carlo, because we did it a few weeks back and Ollie said that it was actually, yeah, from Monte Carlo. So it looks very much like it's the Mediterranean, like maybe- It does. The, so I think that might be that old Monte Carlo series. 
Well, yeah. the nose on this is very floral, um, which is not that surprising for Glen Elgin. But I think, you know, um, I, Lily and Ollie were explaining this to me previously that the um, Whiskey Trail range often is looking for things that are maybe not typical of the distillery's profile. Um, and I don't know if that's the case with this specific one here, but uh, I mean, it's a very spirit driven, I mean, obviously quite pale in color, which we know is not something to be afraid of and sometimes can, can mean that you get something really cool there, but it is yeah. kind of bucking the trend. Like, you know, Diageo would probably not release something um, that color because they know that that's a part of people's buying decisions for a lot of whiskey consumers. Absolutely. I'm really sorry. I just had a guest appearance from a spider that just dropped down beside me and nearly made my heart stop. So I've now managed to catch him in a <laughs> cup. Just in case anybody heard me making an involuntary oh noise as it appeared at my side there. Sorry. That could have been my computer, to be fair, because my computer yeah. makes really funny noises. So if, if you hear funny noises, it's usually my laptop. So don't fret, <laughs> it's probably coming from me. I'm yeah. only disappointed that I didn't notice it while it was happening, because I think that would have been more entertaining. I just, it just came out of the corner of my eye. Oh, my goodness. Anyway. <laughs> Um, I'll talk about Glen Elgin then. So back to Glen Elgin. So it's it, this one on the, the nose of this one, we had a kind of dried raspberries and strawberry, like a, a kind of red fruit, but there's flower there as well and a kind of earthiness. The fruitiness is the key to the character of Glen Elgin. So there, um, there's wort that they produce is, uh, I'm now looking at his web. Terrified it's going to escape. Um, the, <laughs> their wort is very clear and they ferment um, for about 80 to 120 hours. So longer fermentation and then the, the, the process for distilling is a really slow process. And then on top of that, they, their condensers are worm tubs. So worm tubs will produce a heavier spirit. So you've got that, they've, they've stripped all the heavy elements out of it with the the um, slow distillation process, but then when it's going through the worm tubs, it gives it a bit of weight as well. So it's, um, yeah, while it's got a, a nice light fruitiness, I think it's it's definitely got some body to it as well. And it's quite jammy in the, in the palate, I think. Quite fruity. You were saying you got more floral, Andrew, is it? Well, the nose especially to me was very floral. Um, the palette, you can see some of those fruitier tones creeping up. Um, I know Paul, um, Paul here in Calgary was saying berries, stone fruit on the nose for him. I, I get more of those fruits on the palette. I get a bit of that like strawberry Twizzlers sort of thing on the palette. So like artificial strawberry and like waxy yeah. tones at the same time. Yeah, it's quite sparkly as well. It's got a really nice mouthfeel. Mm hmm tiny little bit of spice but yeah uh, all in all it's it's a nice light floral fruity single malt and a nice way to start things off and it's actually now phil and phil and phil and or suzanne in toronto are saying nibs which will be like again that's that strawberry kind of artificial strawberry um sort of flavoring i'm actually now getting something that reminds me a little bit of some of those uh swiss like cherry eau de vie a little bit coming through. Oh, on the okay. Yeah. It's so fruity. Glen Elgin is just such a, it, it's a lovely spirit and it is a frontline single malt. They, they do bottle it um, as a 12 year old. It's, um, there's a lot of it that goes into blends. So it's one of the component malts for White Horse. So along with Linkwood, Glen Loss and Manicmore, those four, um, malts are the, the kind of the frontline malts that go into the white horse and at Glen Elgin they've actually got the white horse emblem on the side of the distillery. It, it is funny um, there's and it's not the only distillery to have you know the blend front and center obviously ba um, uh, Blair Athol has um, Ailes, uh, yeah. Bells, Bell. Craig Illicky has um, Dewar's you know, because not a lot of these single malts are, are still predominantly made for blends rather than for cons consumption of single malts. 
But I think Glenn Elgin's got a bit of a cult following um, amongst at least some people in the know. Um, and yeah, it does have a very fruity, often very floral profile too. I was hosting a tasting last night with a different expression of Glen Elgin and someone um, uh, like attributed it to being a little bit like Irish pot still whiskey, you know, that really fruity, clean, um, just that kind of light spirit character you get from Irish whiskey. But I think mm -hmm. it's, it's got more weight to it than that. It's just, um, yeah, it's a good one. It's a nice one to start with. There's definitely some nice oils to it. Um, and I think that's coming back to talking about the, the it being a bit heavier from the worm tubs, um, uh, which, you know, it's something I think, you know, you showed or Julie, um, sorry, Lily showed the photo earlier, but yeah. um, what people I think don't understand is most distilleries have a much slower, much more gentle form of condensation, whereas those worm tubs are very abrupt. It yeah. just really rapidly cools things down. And in some whiskeys like Craig Illichy, it, it helps to create an almost meaty sulfury profile. But with Glen Elgin, it's, it's not that. It's not a sulfury, it's not a meaty whiskey at all. So um, yeah, it's, it, that's exactly that. And I think it's, it gives it a bit of complexity, you know, like it's um, just as you see, it's that kind of fast um, Con, um, condensing that, that happens with a worm tub. Shell and tube are normally the ones that they have and that just as you see is a really kind of slow flow over shell and tube condensers but um, yeah they take all like that that kind of meatiness and you get whiskies that are generally worm tub um, condensed whiskies you'll get that heavy meaty sometimes sulfury character to them but it just gives it a nice mouthfeel nice oily mouthfeel as well. Yeah. So some good comments here, um, people saying that uh, uh, that it's got a good mouthfeel, some people liking the waxy tones, summery whiskey. Um, both Chelsea and Kathy are referencing a cult here, and I'm, I'm curious to know what this cult is. Um, the cult of, uh, of the Glen Elgin, you said it's got a bit of a cult following. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah. it, I think you know, they're ready for the Glen Elgin cult now. All right, well, you know, I guess we're going to have to work. That'll be your next series of labels, the cult, <laughs> the cult, the cult series. That's it. I was just going to say that's definitely how you start a cult, a cult where you suggest, you plant the seed, you get people on board, and then you say, I don't know what cult it is that you're talking about. <laughs> that's right. There's no that's cult. Genius. <laughs> yeah. First rule about the cult is to not talk about the cult. Uh, <laughs> very, then the very second well done. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> um, incidentally, while we're going through these tonight, um, one of the things we told people before tonight's tasting was that um, people taking part in it would have the first chance to order some of these bottles because we actually held everything back as a little perk for people taking part in the tasting. Um, you will notice there's a little QR code on the bottle. However, I'm not going to take these live until later in the tasting. So it won't work right now, but it will work towards the end or shortly after the tasting. Um, we'll put them all up on the website. I'll go through pricing as well too at the very end. And I do have one other um, announcement of sorts we'll make to just uh, before we wrap. But uh, what do you think, Julie? Shall we move on to some grain whiskey? Certainly, yes, absolutely. So has, oh, well, I can't really do show of hands because a lot of people look at the camera. So we'll keep that. <laughs> um, the, the next whiskey that we're going to taste is from Cambus. So Cambus Distillery was, um, it was opened in the early 1800s in the village of Cambus. So it took the name of the village. Um, and it was one of the very first members of the distillery, the Distillers Company Limited, DCL. So DCL eventually went on to become Diageo of sorts, there were, there were different parts to it, but um, it was absolutely destroyed by a fire in 1913 and it closed, it remained closed for a very, very long time. And in 1938, they opened it back up again and it went, it goes into a lot of blends. This isn't just a closed distillery now, this is a demolished distillery. It doesn't, it, it's not um, 
the, the distillery part of it is completely gone. But nowadays, camp campus site is the site of Diageo's Cooperage Hub. And it adjoins on to the Black Grange warehousing that, that Diageo have. It's just absolutely enormous. I've seen a drone footage of that and it's just so impressive. But anyway, this one that we're going to drink is 29 years old. Green whiskey is different. Um, for anyone who's not had green whiskey before, um, it is produced in a column still rather than a pot still. So it's a continuous distillation process. Green whiskey is the, the basis of blended whiskey. So you'll have green whiskies that are that malt whiskies are added to that will produce blends. Um, and yeah, it's as it's aged, when it goes into blended whiskey, it's young. So it's not got very much character to it at all. But when it's aged, it becomes just this wonderful, mellow, butterscotchy, creamy style of whiskey. Um, and this one is no exception to that. It's sweeter in character than malt whiskies. And this one has had 29 years. This was a, um, a single um, refill American Oak Hog's Head that this one was in. What I it's, usually get with old grain whiskey is that really rich coconut flavour. You get it on the nose and you will also get it on the palate. For me, it's so typical of older grain whiskey. And you get that really rich, creamy character. It's like it always reminds me like of custard and coconut slice. It's just got so much yeah. uh, sweet, creamy flavours. It's just so different from single malt. And it's, it's wonderful to be able to try something like this. Yeah. From, especially from canvas because we, we can no longer get canvas single grain so it's really exciting it's very decadent um to me on the nose you know you said coconut it makes me think of like coconut icing so mm. there's a there's a little cupcake shop down the street from the store which i'm proud to say i was their very first customer when they opened like 10 11 years ago i was like waiting outside the door the day they opened but they make a coconut cream icing sugar cupcake and this is just exploding that on the nose for me grain whiskeys kind of uh i think a lot of people who are on tonight's tasting will have tried them before because um our business we love independent bottlings and grain whiskeys have really been built um the brand single grains have been built by independent bottlers or companies like compass box with their blended grain whiskeys and they've got a following for sure and i think they've often too been a, a place of value where people can get older whiskeys at a more reasonable price because um, they were made in large quantities. Um, they're maybe not quite as in demand as older single malts. And so sometimes you can get them for, for a lot better prices too. Yeah. But just, if you start to explore old green whiskeys, they're just, they're so beautiful. They're so, but there's, there's a kind of, you can taste aged, the, the age of the whiskey. It's like a kind of almost on the nose, it's almost like your coconut cream cupcake in a dusty library, you know, like with old books and leather seats and things like that. It's got that kind of. Well, and this one here um, is reminding me on the, the palette of, uh, um, almost of like a light rum. Um, it's got this really nice, um, I don't even know how to describe it, but there's something that just reminds me of like a mature rum on the palate. A kind of estery, light mm. the esteryness to it. I think, um, yeah, it's quite apple-y for me on the palate, but like apple and butterscotch. So uh, cooked apples with butterscotch sauce on them. My taste mm. did not was really <laughs> dirt driven and cake driven. Um, but another note that we've got in our official notes are um, a very light chamomile tea on the palate of this one as well. Mm -hmm. You know, grain, grain whiskeys, I think, were probably maligned for a while because people just thought that, well, it's just someone trying to, to sell something inferior to single malts. And I think even for myself, I probably didn't always put them in the best light, even when they were good. I'd 
sort of describe them as accidentally good whiskeys because they were never they were never made to be drank at 30, 40, 50 years as a single grain. They were made to be put into blends, but they were distilled to a very high level of purity. So they're very clean. And if you put them into a half decent barrel or even an average barrel for a longer period of time, there's potential for them to pick up character and to esterify and oxidize in the cask and become more interesting. And I think you're right. The, the, the unfortunate thing is that a lot of the grain whiskey that is used by the blenders is put in at a young age because they're not looking for character. They're just looking for something that's of a minimum age that doesn't taste offensive or, or isn't going to ruin the flavor of the blend. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, the, there was, so I was to Ollie about this. So Ollie Chilton's are, um, I always run through his list of credentials about what he's head of, but he's basically our head of Elixir Distillers. He does all our blending, looks after all our casks, takes care of the liquid, drives Lily up the wall because she's got to chase him all the time to do things for her. But he's just, you know, so, and I was talking to him about greens a while back and he was saying, aged green now, um, there would have been a kind of, there was an ambition to, to release um, aged blends. So there was, a, there was a time and place where blends were really booming and the people were looking for difference and looking for age and, you know, and obviously these things don't happen overnight, just, with the, just obviously. Um, and there was a drive to have aged blends and the, the blend market kind of dipped again which meant all of this green whiskey that was that had been aged for longer was then available on the market for us to to get our hands on so it's um in in two whiskeys time so we've got one in between but we've got another green whiskey coming up as well um and when you know like canvas is a little bit different because this is a closed distillery now and you you know you're you're not necessarily going to see it in things the one that we'll try in an in another two whiskeys time is is current and it, it's used in blends and it's um it's an interesting one because when you learn about the blend that it goes into um you can kind of see where the character's coming in but but yeah i think it's um it's an interesting one to put side by side with with malt whiskey because it's definitely got a place and it's been all of those years so they, they'll not they'll not be in active casks they'll not be in first fill casks and things like that because the intention will not have been at the start for that whiskey to be um, terribly cask influenced. It will have been destined for blending. So, mm. um, but yeah, Canvas is definitely one to look out for. 29 years old and at 52%, it's still old in its weight and ABV. Green whiskey's put into the cask at a higher alcohol strength as well. So it holds its own. I added a, a few drops of water in mine just to see what happened. And I actually think it makes it even, it makes it more drinkable on the palate. Um, without water, I find the finish on it is quite drying. And, yeah. and I'm not normally somebody who likes adding water to my whiskey, but it is 27 degrees outside. And uh, I figured I'd throw a drop in there to see what happens. And it's, the, the nose is still very pleasant. It didn't, it didn't alter it in a way that I was disappointed by, I guess is what I'm saying. It's, uh, yeah, but it's also 52%. You know? So like if you just cut the sharp corners off it with a couple of drops of water, it does open out a kind of buttery, mm -hmm. creamy note to it as well. Andrew, did you remember to record this meeting? Because oh, I, totally, I, I totally didn't. So I'm just <gasps> going to hit record we, right now. This is the, we don't even have it on record that you didn't mind water well, being added to your whiskey? <laughs> Well, we've just started recording now, so there's well, people will never know that or hear that. So okay. I know you know we need Chelsea, you to admit it. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. And we also well, need to start doing that record automatically and then trim the ends and whatnot. But anyway, we're all we're all good. It's all happening. It's Chelsea's all Andrew. We'll know everybody will know you had it water to your whiskey. <laughs> I've, and he I've, didn't mind it. <laughs> I've been put on, I've been on the record several times over the last uh, year in these virtual tastings saying that, and the average keeps coming down that, you know, at first it was like 99% of the time I don't like adding water. And now I think we're down to 90% of the time I don't <laughs> like, so that I'm, 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 you know, being open about that a little bit more. 
Uh, one thing I did want to say, though, and I have to give uh, credit to Lily's former boss, uh, John Glazer, Compass Box, who I'm a huge fan of, um, you know, to, to let people give them a bit of insight, you know, while the big commercial blenders really use the grain whiskey for the body of their blends, and it's kind of not really considered for character, you know, John Glazer Compass Box has a very different philosophy on that. He uses it to add delicacy and sometimes decadence and finesse. It's, it's truly a, a part of it as opposed to just something to build other components on top of. And I think is probably the place that grain whiskey should be held is, is it when it's good, it's good. It's not just filler. Um, and I think this is an example of that. Yeah. I've that said, I've tasted really young green whiskey that's been fabulous. It's been in a really active cask and it's so, it would blow your head off because it's really high strength, young and punchy and taking influence from cask gives it the kind of wood influence and at such a young age, it's just insane. It's good to try them young as well, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. It's all about the cask. Yeah. That's right. The spirit itself is, yeah, but if you get a good cast, even young grain whiskey can taste amazing. And yeah. again, to, to, to go back to what Andrew was saying, it's just, I've had the opportunity to try many grain whiskies in my past days with Compass Box, and we tried some young grains as well as some really old grains. And that really opened my world because I was very much into single malt, single cast, cast strengths. And it's just, you know, something you kind of look at with, you know, a bit of disdain. It's like, oh, it's grain whiskey, it's rubbish. It's stuff you use for blending, but it's, it, it can be absolutely wonderful. And I think that's the beauty of the whiskey trail is that you can actually have grain whiskies as part of the range because we, we couldn't obviously bottle grain whiskey under the single malts of Scotland rain. So that's a great place to put the wonderful whiskies that don't quite have a place elsewhere. So. That's why I really, really love this one. And the next one, well, the, the, the other grain we see that we're going to taste this evening, because it's just such a different facet of the whiskey world, which is absolutely amazing to me. You know, so, I just wanted to throw... Sorry, sorry, Julie, I didn't mean to interrupt. Sorry. I was going to say it's great to have two in a lineup. It doesn't happen very often that you have two aged grains in a lineup of whiskey. So it is, it's, quite a, it's quite exciting tonight. Sorry, I, I, I think we interrupted each other, so you can... Oh, that's, that's okay. La ladies first, as, as it goes. <laughs> um, I just wanted to bring up, kind of because it was funny, um, Duncan Taylor, a few years ago, we, we had an, uh, a rare, rare and old, as their brand goes, Gervin, that was six years old, which was a little bit, you know, um, tongue-in-cheek to be referring to a six-year-old whiskey as rare and old. But it was in a sherry cask and it was superb. And I wanted with every bone in my body to hate it because of the gall of putting a six-year-old whiskey and calling it rare and old, but it was actually lovely. Um, so yeah, when grain whiskey in a good cask is young and it can still be good. It's just, unfortunately, it's, they're not put into active casks very often. You're getting that... The, the length of time that the, the whiskey's there and it's, you know, moving in and out of the wood and the wood's doing its job and filtering that spirit for such a long time, it just creates, just it's a, a beautiful, delicate spirit with, with green. When it's younger, it's year, but when it's older, then it's just, it's so mellow. And I definitely think you can, you can taste that it's almost antique, can't you? And it's, mm -hmm. yeah. Have we got any questions from anyone? I've been neglecting the chat for a few minutes here, but there's been some good comments. Paul, Paul Parson here in Calgary saying it swims much juicier with water. Um, and Clint, Clint was asking about water. Does it swim well, which is a good way to put it. So I think we covered that. Um, so mm -hmm. I think we're all caught up on the comment side of things. I think we're, we're ready to move on to something I'm really enjoying nosing right now. Yeah, absolutely. So drum three that we're going to have tonight from the Ben Nevis Distillery. Ben I'm Nevis. Start distillery. sharing my screen again. <laughs> Sorry, Hi. you're probably going to see no, the no, comments. No, 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 it's okay. Um, the the um, Ben Nevis. I have to say, as a as a whiskey as a whiskey drinker, Ben Nevis was a distillery that I 
hadn't got on well with in previous years. And then I started working at Alexa Distillers and the Ben Nevis that we have in stock is just absolutely phenomenal. 1996, it turns out, is 95 and 96 is definitely the time for, for Ben Nevis. This one was distilled. I'm just realising now I've got all the dates that all the other ones were distilled and I haven't told you any of them, but this one was distilled on the 1st of November, 1996. It's 23 years old. It's a single um, hoggy. And this one is coming in at 54.3%. Um, the, the labels of, of this one, oops, um, if I can, if I can show you this one. The, the labels that we have on this one are, um, this is called video games. So was 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 this range Ollie's choice? Because Ollie, I think, is cl close to same vintage as me, maybe a little younger. And right. these look like super or like the the original Nintendo Entertainment System, That's, which yeah. I had when I was a small boy. Yeah, I'm not managing to get this on the screen. I can try sharing mine if yours isn't working, Julie. I don't know why it's not. I don't know why it's not coming on. Show all the windows. There we go. So this is, um, yeah, it's a little bit, my, my two nieces play Minecraft and I think it's quite Minecrafty looking as well. So this is the video games range of the Whiskey Trail. So we're going from these beautiful Art Deco cars to now we're doing a video games range. So this is what I mean, it's just, it, it's just, uh, we get to have a lot of fun with these. But um, that, is canvas that's why it's not right god mm. i'm like i'm looking at the abv thinking no that's definitely not right julie i can uh julie if you want i can pull it up i've got the tasting note and bottle that's image cool. here so let me um oh. share my <laughs> screen um and i'll try to get all the relevant details visible there we go um, one sec. So the, cam yeah. the canvas one was also video games as well. So cars for the first one, video games for the next two. Um, so they're quite quirky labels. Um, as I say, our, um, our creative director has got some brilliant ideas. <laughs> they're just great. Well, and I know there's we have some customers who are desperate to get a bottle or two of these ones, especially like the cars they were excited about. But the video yeah. games ones they are especially excited definitely. about. Definitely. I'll give you a sneak preview of the, the ones that are coming as well at the end. But um but yeah, we've got the, the tasting note around this, it's um it, it's fruity and it's again that kind of it's a kind of dustiness to it as well. Ben Nevis is um it's, oh, I, I was going to say something there that might sound offensive. I went to visit Ben Nevis Distillery and it was all cobwebs and dirty and not the nicest of places. So it's owned by Nika. It is, um, it has been a bit neglected over the years, but they still produce some pretty phenomenal whiskey. A lot of their whiskey goes over to Japan. They were bought in, um, in 1989 by Nika. And um, so Nika rear malt, I think it is, is probably predominantly Ben Nevis. There's a lot of their, a lot of their liquid goes over. But, um, but the distillery, this kind of interest in history on their distillery, they were, they were bought, the original guy that, that had it was known as Long John McDonald's. So Long John blended whiskey, you maybe have seen over the years. Um, was named after him. Ben Nevis was one of the components of that. But when he passed away, um, the, the distillery was bought by this guy called Joseph Hobbs. He was a Canadian. And he was like the great Gatsby of the whiskey world. Nobody quite knew where he'd come from and nobody quite knew what his story was. There's lots and lots of different stories about him. Um, 
some said that he had shot down a zeppelin in the First World War and others insisted that he, he built the tallest skyscraper in Canada and that he was a smuggler and that he had all these different shrouded and mystery stories. But um, that all that aside, he made an awful lot of money in the whiskey industry, but he lost his money. He lost his fortune during the, the Great Depression. Um, and he came back to the UK in the 20s with less than a thousand pounds to his name. So he was um, he was in the position where he sold on the, the distillery um, to Seeger Evans um, and Associated Scottish Distilleries as well. But, um, but I, I quite like the idea that he was um, quite flamboyant and and interesting for everybody but yeah it's um it's owned by it's owned by nika these days but ben nevis um nine, 1996 definitely is the vintage and this is this is one of them it's um one of our notes on this is that it smells like jelly beans and i think if you open a bag of jelly sweeties the the smell of the fruity jelly sweeties i don't know so, maybe. julie i want to just touched on something you said earlier about the place being dirty and neglected. Yeah. Um, I, I, well, the first time I went to Scotland uh, was around 2005. And this is before like whiskey tourism really got going. And, but I'd been to Auchentoshan, you know, the city of your, the, the, the distillery of your hometown. Yeah. And it was beautiful. And then I went to Erin, which was fairly new and it was beautiful. And then I went to Campbellton and walked around Springbank, which back then, I mean, it was in good shape, but uh, you know, yeah. it hadn't been painted in a hundred years. Um, they took me to Glen Scotia, which looked like it was going to fall down. Absolutely. And yeah. it, it was like, it was truly neglected. And what I've come to learn over time is that sometimes neglect creates great whiskey unintentionally because maybe they're not running 24 seven and their fermentations are running long. Maybe they're not in a rush to distill the batch they're doing today because they're only doing one run a day. So they don't need to maximize the use of their stills. And I think this applies to that era of Ben Nevis where they were not rushed. They weren't in a hurry. And when I nose this, like there's, there's a milkiness to it that makes me think this went into lactic fermentation, like really towards the end of the fermentation. And then for the fruits there, like it's like opening a pack of wine gums, like all those gelatin, citrus, fruity wine gum flavors on the nose. Yeah. On the palate, there's a bit of, um, I think there's a bit of tropical fruit on the palate as well. That really fruity flavor. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. I have to say has transformed my opinion of Ben Nevis. Um, we went, I organized a whiskey club in Glasgow and we, we went on the train up to up to Ben Nevis for a for a visit one Saturday, and um, there was a big crowd of us, and they were taking us, and you almost felt as though you were having to draw in, walking around the place that you didn't want to touch any of the walls or anything because it was just it's filthy. Like, but <laughs> the stories were great and um, real characters that work in the place. But um, yeah, they they shared a whiskey with us that they had blended at birth and it was 50 years old and and they gave us the smallest amount we had big whiskey tumblers and the, like a millimeter of whiskey on the bottom of it so and then a wee lady came out and gave us sandwiches and it was a very bizarre experience going to Ben Nevis the back the back um room that we were in had like a really old-fashioned carpet like you were in someone's granny's house you know it was really just really strange experience but oh. What was the distillery? He just retired. What was the distillery manager's name again? Because he was a bit of a legend. Oh, was it Colin? Colin, yeah, that's right, Colin. Um, yeah. Because yeah, he had, you know, everyone credits, because I think he was more or less just left alone by Nika to make whiskey. Yeah. And they're like, just make sure that 70% of it finds its way into tankers <laughs> to Japan. And you can do whatever you want with the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we've been very lucky. Um, Ollie, Ollie uh, was generous enough to give us a sherry bud of 96 a couple of years back. That was, mm. I mean, one of my staff nailed it on the head. It was gooey. Like it was so fruity and thick. It, it was like a gooey whiskey and people just yeah. lapped it up. It's great when, you know, when it, it brings a description like that, it's, 
It's so interesting. We had one, I have to say, the very first time I worked with Elixir, I wasn't actually working with them. I was doing only a favour to cover a show. And um, and I was so excited to taste this Ben. No, I wasn't excited to taste the Ben Nevis. That's what it was. And I, you know, I kind of disregarded it and, and didn't play with it at all at the whiskey show. And then I discovered it. And I was practically shouting with a loud hailer to get everybody to come and try it because it was just, just so delicious. The one I tasted after that took me right back to, it tasted like pickled onion corn puff crisps, which just, yeah, lots of people loved it and I didn't, but, but uh, you know, I, I love the fruity ones, definitely. Really good. So mango comes out with water, that's a great shout, Paul, actually. I get that kind of tropical note on the palate. Lily, you, you were about to chime in with a comment, I think, or a tasting note or something. I, I, I was, but uh, Julie covered it pretty much when, when she was saying all the things. So I'm just, yeah, I'm just enjoying the chat. <laughs> well, and Alan's got a good note here about this being refreshing. I think this is, I, I think we might have struggled a bit with a really thick, heavy, you need enough to knife to cut through it, sherry bomb of a Ben Nevis today, whereas this is just, it's light, it's fresh, it's fruity. It's so fruity and yeah, really lovely. I think it's um, it's really tropical and light. And you wonder if this, I, I know that people might rail against me saying something like this, but it might make a really nice highball, you know, like just a really light. And, now you're uh, talking Japanese. I know. <laughs> that fits in with the Nevis after all. It does, exactly. absolutely. It absolutely fits in, fits in with a profile, but you know, like just that nice fruity, clean, yeah. I think a scotch good. and soda would be great, Julie. So mm. I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> and to go with the tropical notes instead of like garnishing with a lime, just like a couple drops of yuzu would be awesome in there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, um, I, I just threw, um, sorry to interrupt really, but I just threw a file onto the uh, chat. It's an article that I wrote about Ben Nevis and this might be the unedited version because usually I just let the magazine edit it because I, I don't have time to edit everything. It's a stream of consciousness. Once it's out, I pass it on and they can clean it up. But um, it's, a, and it's interesting because Julie touched on Long John McDonald who is an absolutely fascinating character in Scotch whiskey. Um, he was six foot six in an era when most people were barely five foot eight. Um, he was essentially considered the um, search and rescue team, not just person, but like he was like a one man team that they would send out into the night to rescue hikers in the Victorian era. So for anyone who's interested, download that. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's a kind of a fun background because he was a terrible businessman. He was a good self promoter. Um, but he was not a very good businessman, but he was a larger than life character that was literally a legend throughout the UK in his era. Um, and also apparently a descendant of a ruler of Argyll as well. So not only was he a big character, he was came from royalty too. Oh, there you go. There you go. Maybe not royalty, came from power. Well, I mean, that's kind of like uh, Alex Bruce from Adelphi, who that's it. has course. a direct See? line of descent from Robert the Bruce, which is incredible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think it gets him anything, but uh, it's it's a cool, cool fact. It's a, it's a fun fact to tell people in the pub. That's what that is. <laughs> yeah. All right. Should we go back yeah, to green? Do. Yes. Yes. So Let's get more people into uh, the grain cult. I think we managed to convert quite a few, but I think we can get a few more with this one. I definitely, yeah, there's definitely room for more. Um, Lily and I, this one is, this one is so, um, it's been used so much in our office that they were absolutely, they were put, this is the size of our sample. So we had these ones for everything else. And we had these little dinky bottles that were only half full. I was, I was decanting what I had left in the house to send over to Lily for us. So this one, um, this is a 32 year old single grain from Invergordon Distillery. 
Um, so this was a single barrel, so less bottles again, only 205 bottles of this one were produced. Um, but after 32 years, you're going to find that. And this one, I was actually laughing when I looked at this earlier on. We do, um, Lily and myself and our colleagues Chanel and Adele have started to do tasting panels. And this is the one that made me go out and buy so that I could send to everyone that I went out and bought Tonka beans to actually taste it, to smell Tonka beans. So Lily's got her little jar there because I kept seeing reference to it and um, bursting with Tonka beans was the, and it made me smile when I read it tonight because that's where the, the Tonka bean obsession came from. And Lily and I met the other day and she baked me cookies with Tonka beans. So all comes back round. Anyway, <laughs> this one is 32 years old, 52.7% uh, ABV. So Invergordon Distillery is actually quite far up in the Highlands. It sits between Dalmore and Glenmorangie, other way round. Um, and it's, it, it's a fairly modern distillery in that it was founded in 59 and they started operating there in 1961. So it's owned by White and Mackay. It's been owned by them since 1993. So Invergordon produces the green whiskey that goes into White and Mackay blend. Do you get White and Mackay in Canada? Um, we do. I wouldn't say it's exactly popular, though. Um, right. And in particular, I think uh, our business is, uh, you know, we, I've been accused of being a, malt, a single malt snob. Um, I do love a good blend, um, but I'm not, I don't really have time for the little mass market um, blends that are out there. Supermarket blends. Yeah. And I, so I think it's been available at times, but it's never really caught on. Mm. Um, but Inver Gordon is the first uh grain distillery that i ever laid my eyes on i i didn't tour it but it was mm -hmm. when i was driving up the northern highlands for the first time to see glen Morangy and kleinlish and pulteney i drove by this place and my map and i saw the town named invergordon and then i saw what looked like an oil refinery only later did i realize that that is the invergordon grain distillery i mean that'll give people a sense of how big these places are they are like essentially a petroleum refinery yeah, huge. They're just big powerhouse distilleries. Oh, that's it there. It's really? um, yeah, so beautiful. You wonder why we don't talk about grain whiskey when we talk about <laughs> Scotch whiskey. This is why, because they're not the sexy distilleries we want you to come and visit. They, they, as Andrew said, it's more like an oil refinery slash pharmaceutical plant. So it's not the glamorous side of the whiskey business, unfortunately. I, I love the sign on the gate that says, sorry, no tours. You're not allowed in. That's it. It's and just... I also love the EU flag, which obviously <laughs> is a, it's an old photo. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. They might still be flying it up there. Well, yeah. <laughs> there's, I, um, I, sorry, there's I was going to say, sorry, go ahead, Chelsea. There's just a great question in the chat here from Phil and Suzanne, um, and they're asking, are green whiskeys distilled at a higher ABV, uh, 32 years and still only 52.7% in reference Absolutely. to this one? So, yeah, they are. They are indeed. They are distilled, I want to see in the high, does it come off? I think it come off into the 90s. It Some of them are yeah. 90s, so it? it's, yeah. it's minimum of 90 for EU and 91 for the US for anything grain whiskey. So it's yeah, yeah in, the, in the 90s. So that's why yeah. you tend to find even on super old grain whiskeys, you tend to find really yeah. high strength. Yeah. So because they tend to be distilled at much higher strength, they reduce them before going into cask, but they can Put them into cask at 70s and over so that's why you tend to have really really high strength even older grain whiskies and one well, they often are put into to as we've already mentioned <clears throat> tired old barrels they're rarely put into fresh ones so i think the converse to that is you do get from time to time a considerable amount of loss just because maybe they're not put into the best casks or they're and put in palletized warehouses instead of say a dunnage warehouse so there's going to be higher temperatures and again more opportunity for temperature climate related um, loss yeah. but 
Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a it's an interesting distillery. I think it's one that that has a bit of a following. Like when we get older bottlings of Invergordon, because it, I find it for my palate, it's it is one of the more characterful grains. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we talked about them being distilled to high proof. I mean, the best analogy for a lot of people would be to think of it as essentially vodka. They're they're distilling the grains to a level of purity that's not far off of vodka so that they don't have flavor that are going to interfere with the blends when they blend them in. And it's really the oak that's giving a big, and that, that time in the oak that's giving it most of the flavor at the end of the day, as opposed to a malt whiskey, which can be the spirit can be giving you most of the flavor, depending on how active the cask is and how old it is. It's de there's different grains as well. So corn and wheat and rye, it's not got the same. So the malted barley that you're getting from pot still, um, distilled whiskey it's it, it's just different and it's a just as I said earlier on it's a powerhouse so they are normally in kind of quite industrial settings green distilleries I think Invergordon is a bit different it's kind of it's in the highlands and it just kind of just as you said it takes people by surprise and you think it's something else because it doesn't fit with where it is close to me is Strathclyde distillery and for years, I didn't know what the big chimney was down in the Gorbals. And it's going 24-7. It's just all the time. And it's just steam that's coming out of the top of this chimney. But you can always you can always see it and you can smell it in the air as well, depending. So you've got Tenants Brewery on one side and you've got the, the green distillery on the other. And depending which way the wind's blowing, you can smell the, the brewery or the distillery. But, um, but they're not particularly pretty places to go and visit. Um, interesting if you geek about it and if you can manage to get in but they don't really do tours and things like that so you need to know someone but um, but yeah Chelsea buttered popcorn would be absolutely perfect it's, it is buttery isn't it it's got a real nose of, the nose of this is almost pillowy like it's so soft <laughs> um, it would be like falling on a pile of like giant marshmallows <laughs> That's it. We had a different from the canvas that we had as well. So it's nice to see two different examples of green whiskies. They're roughly about the same age group, but they're very different in character. So it's quite nice to have those two. If you actually go back, if you've got any of the canvas left and you go back to it, on the, on the nose, they're both very sweet and they're both kind of buttery and creamy. But I think on the palate, there's definitely a, a real difference in, in flavour. The canvas is like, um, we get we get boiled sweeties here called Werther's Originals. I don't know if you get them. Mm -hmm. That's a Scotch hard candy. I get that from the canvas and the. I think you. I think you're right. That kind of marshmallowy. Yeah, it's it's soft. It's mm -hmm. sweet. Um, there's no rough edges to it. It's just, it's very, very easy drinking. I think that's possibly why Lily and I only got half of these little bottles because yeah. I think they would, you know, when they were sampling in the office, we probably- I reckon so. There's a bit too many, many tasting notes on this one. Yeah, it's delicious. Just double checking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, marshmallow and powdered sugar, yeah. It's, um, I think to me the Invergordon has got more character to it. I think it's got more um, there's that more layer, more layers of flavors with the the Invergordon. Mm -hmm. when we when we were doing a tasting panel and I can't think what one it was the lead that we did and we were getting new magazines, the smell of new magazines. Oh, that was the um, was it not the Glen Lossy? Might it might have been. I can't remember, but you know that kind of, you know the smell when you open a new glossy mm -hmm. magazine from the from the paper. You get a little bit of that on the nose as well. A little bit floral. Yeah, delicious. I love it. Nearly finished. I'm going to save that one. Has anyone tried adding water to theirs just to see what happens? I have added water to mine. Because it's 52.7, so it's still pretty punchy. You can take it. A few drips anyway. It's 
What do you think, guys? Are we enjoying green whiskey so far? Sorry, I'm just reading the, the comments here. Just to well, and I'm, I'm going to share prices for these at the end too, but I think people will be pretty happy with um, the value proposition of a 29 and 32 year old whiskey when they, when they see the prices. So, you know, cause that's always part of the, part of the metric too, right? Um, but yeah, for, for the price point, these are lovely, they're elegant. Um, and I think that they do the style justice. Like they're not just a grain of a certain age, they've actually got some character to them. Yeah. So this was another video games label that we had in um, this Invergordon. So this was um, video games was volume four. I think the, the cars was, um, does that tell me? Volume two. So it's not an old label for us at all. It's only, we've only had that in production for a couple of years. But um, I think it was, a, a desire to be bottling whiskey that was not necessarily running in line with the other labels that we had. Um, and also um, Ollie and Raj, who's our, um, who's our creative director, just got to play with labels and come up with really, really cool ideas. And we do bottle for, um, for different markets. So we do market exclusives of Whiskey Trail. And uh, there's been some really wacky labels on those ones over the years. They've been, they've been really interesting. Sometimes when I first started, so I started with Elixir um, in 2019. Um, I came from a background of local authority. So I worked for education services and did whiskey, fed my soul with whiskey jobs at weekends and evenings. I, um, I was doing the, the job that paid the mortgage Monday to Friday at, that was destroying my soul. Which, so it meant that I was working seven days a week sometimes just trying to, to, get, um, to get something out of whiskey. And, um, and I got an opportunity that was just wonderful. And I left um, after 20, this is where I give away my age and things like that, but I left after 24 years and six months to the day I left my, my job in education services and went freelance and I worked with Elixir for five months and then they took me on permanently, which was great because I didn't cope very well being a freelance person, having been <laughs> in for 20, for nearly 25 years. Um, so the one of the, the first weeks I was down, um, I would do a week a month in the, the office in London because I'm obviously based in Glasgow. And, um, and every time, I felt like every time I went down, we were to come up with a new idea for Whiskey Trail labels. <laughs> it was just, can anybody find pictures of bridges? And we're all Googling, <laughs> trying to find all these different images and things like that. It was just, it was always good fun. Whiskey Trail is a great, a great label to play with. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. They have some crazy ideas, I must say. Our creative director is, is quite, yeah, out there in terms of the ideas that he comes up with. And sometimes we have to rein him in a little bit because some of it is just a little bit too out there. And it's it, we want the whiskey to do the talking. The label does a lot of the talking, but sometimes it's a little bit too loud. So we, we have sometimes to say, well, we like it, but, you know, tame it down just a little bit. I'll show you, I've got the, the new line, but I'll wait till the end till we're finished talking about these whiskies. But um, my favourite ones, I'll show you at the end. See, um, you, your favourite and it's my least favourite of the lot. I know, you don't like them. I absolutely oh. adore them. I absolutely adore them. You know, Julie, I'm not going to spit it out here, but I have, I have what I believe is an incredible concept for a range of whiskies. And I think I'm going to have to pass them by Ollie to see if there's something he might be willing to do for me. Um, I can't say anything more, but there's been a lot of laughs at the shop with the whiskey guys when we came up with this range of whiskeys. And Fantastic. all I can say is it was inspired by the first time I heard about the existence of elephant polo. And it kind of blew my mind because I was thinking like, that's ridiculous. You know, of, of all the things in the world, like that's just so over the top. <laughs> um so we are so doing this andrew i'll oh, find yeah. somebody <laughs> yeah i'll talk to you you might not be cool with the name i came up for it but okay. we'll see we'll see 
just talk to me, Andrew. I'll okay, make it we'll, happen. <laughs> we'll talk because because I think it would be a lot of fun. And if anything, anybody knows anything about our shop, it's that we're not afraid of labels that are a little edgy and a little bit fun. Um, we currently just a little tidbit nugget for people to enjoy to stew on for a while. We have an unnamed Highland malt from the town of Brora coming in shortly from uh, Adam Brands uh, that features Sam Simmons and I urinating on the Duke of Sutherland's monument. So if that's not too far for us to go, you can only imagine what else what else could be a possibility, a potentiality? And by the way, for anyone who doesn't know, the Duke of Sutherland was a terrible, terrible person. He was a terrible man. Horrible terrible man. Just man, yes. Yeah. You're right to be urinating on his statue. Yeah. Anyway, shall, oh, we, shall, shall we move on to, on that note, to, to 1989 Glenn Rothes? <laughs> that means a nice steak. We had to yeah. We'll just <laughs> slide into that. <laughs> So this, uh, this whiskey is um, from Glenrothes, which is owned by Edrington. This is the oldest malt that we've got in the lineup tonight. So this is 30 years old. Oh, I just love this one. It's so... Oh boy. It's like... I'm glad I, I saved the special glass for this one. I know it's going to be harder to drink it, but oh man, the nose on this is just explosive. It's beautiful. It's got like old polished wooden bookshelves, you know. I always yep. just that kind of old well thumbed book and old polished bookshelves. It it also reminds me of like old fashioned dinner mints that you'd get at like a fancy steakhouse. Yeah, yeah. Oh, a little and it mint. sorry, so fruity. Yeah, there's a little bit of fresh mint. On the, the end of the nose. It's beautiful. This one was distilled on the 11th of um, October 1989. So yeah, that's uh, that's been that's been around for a little while. So Glen Rothes are owned by Edrington. This is another one of the vintage cars. I wasn't I didn't catch where the, the picture was if we were in Monte Carlo oh. for that one. Let's see. <laughs> I think we're in the Alps or something. In the Alps. There yeah, look at that. It looks very mountainy. It sure does. Mm -hmm. Look very Glen Rothesy anyway, but <laughs> Some, somewhere in Switzerland. We'll just Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Yeah. Then it makes me think of Great Gatsby, these labels. Like I think they're really kind of rolling twenties, like they're just really cool. But um, yeah, so Glen Rothes is owned by Edrington and it sits right in the heart of Speyside in the town of Rothes, um, known by those who live in Rothes as God's own country. Um, it's, it's a beautiful part of the world. Um, Glen Rothes is a component, so for the blend side of things, is a component of Cutty Sark and Famous Grouse, but they also bottle it um, as its own and they've got quite, their own bottlings are quite, um, Iconic, they're like a kind of barrel shaped bottle, and um, quite sleek. So, yeah, they're they're, a, they're an interesting distillery. They are one of the haunted distilleries in Scotland, um, where you have the toast to the ghost. So the it's a it's a tradition in a number of distilleries, and um, it's the ghost at Glenrothes Distillery is of an African man who was rescued by um, Major James Grant in uh, the 20th century, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, he was coming back from the Boer War and brought this boy back, rescued him and brought him back. And he served as this eccentric old Major's butler and page boy and just basically served him until the day he died and he outlived the major by about 40 years so he was known as um his name was Baiwa Makalaga but he was known as Baiwe and um he integrated really well into the community in Glenrothes he was part of the football team and he was just well loved in the community but um he when he passed away seven years following his death 
they brought new stills into Glenrothes and all of a sudden his ghost started to appear in the still room and they called someone in. So in came a, a, a professor, a university professor to, to investigate this and he discovered that the shiny new stills had been moved and they had disturbed a ley line for those who believe in ghosts. And, um, and apparently he went out and had a good chat with Byway at his graveside and sorted it all out with him, went back and moved the stills and sorted them. And he's not been seen since, apparently. But to keep up with fear and tradition, everybody toasts the ghost in Glenrothes Distillery. So there you go, a wee toast to Byway. Um, so <laughs> I, I've, I've always thought this story was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> Because, I mean, there's a lot that's eccentric about um, Glen Grant, which is the distillery that the major that's family right, owned. Right. Like yeah. he, he put in an African themed garden in a part of the world that has a climate that's not like almost not anywhere African. in Africa. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, under the, under the lens of the modern day, um, bringing this young boy home with him, probably yeah. not, you know, he he the, he gave this person a great life, and as yeah. you said, he became a part of the community. But you know, one wonders how much choice this young child had to come back with him. Um, it, it was <laughs> always he was yeah. yeah, it was it was a different time um, for sure. But also the story, in a way, like that the the ghost was Byways' ghost, almost just you know the whole the whole thing is kind of from a, a, a 21st century perspective, is <laughs> a bit of a, you know, funny story to look back on. <laughs> yeah. It would be terribly worried about the movement. A black I ghost, so. A black yeah. ghost. <laughs> yeah. I, think, um, I think the thing that he was worried about was that it was going to alter Glen Rothis because they had moved the stills, you know, like mm -hmm. you had everything the same. So Byway was taken care of the Glen it's distillery yeah you're absolutely right it's ridiculous but anyway yeah. <laughs> i always think it's a good story though by the way the ghost. it's a great it's a great story um there's one other one that um since we're doing a tasting in canada tonight that people might like uh the the, the second time we went to glenrothes we were actually wandering through the cemetery because we'd heard the story about byway and um there's actually at least two and possibly three canadian servicemen from World War I buried in the cemetery in front of Glenrothes Distillery. Right. And they were they were part of a labor battalion that was cutting down trees for the trenches. And they okay. obviously died of disease or injury or something. And they're buried um, at Glenrothes Distillery. Wow. Apparently the, the headstones in the distillery, so you'll find buildings that are next to distilleries are covered in a kind of black whiskey fungus. I can't say pronounce the name but you'll see like houses and other buildings around distilleries that that kind of and I think a lot of the time distilleries will kind of go no that's nothing to do with us no that's no that's just dirty it's not but apparently the gravestones in Rothes Cemetery are all covered in this black whiskey fungus which is delightful really I mean that, that makes it even a uh, even spookier I'm sure in the dark all the black yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do we think of this one, guys? I mean, oh, it's lovely. Um, I, you know, the the nose on this is spectacular. I could just sit here and nose this. It it's just yeah. it's such a tropical fruit bomb on the nose. This is, um, you know, Glen Rothis. I think most people who followed the distillery bottlings will think sherry because a lot of what they do gets put into sherry. Mm. But this is a very spirit-driven, naked Glenrothes, 30 years of age. And it's had a lot of time to really kind of evolve in the cask. And I think it's just lovely. Mm. It has got a real tropical note to it, doesn't it? I think another, it's that kind of, um, I think the word rancio isn't, it, it doesn't sound like a nice word because I used to always associate it with kind of rancid and rotten and things like that but that aged um you know like the the kind of aged books aged leather aged wood that kind of character comes through on this one so i think it's um it gives it a real austere 
presence, if you like. It's just um, mm -hmm. well, like asking whether or not to add water. I think personally, because it's quite a low strength, it's forty six point one. I personally like it as it is. I don't think water would damage it, but personally, I think it drinks very nicely at the the strength it's bottled, so forty six point one. Yeah. Well, to chime in with my two cents on that, Lily, I, I find whiskeys that are roughly older than 20 years don't tend to take water very well either. So there's kind of this metric, like if it's high alcohol, maybe a few drops, low alcohol, generally not. And especially older whiskeys, they just tend to be more fragile. And, and this one here is incredibly delicate. I'd be leery about adding water to it. I think if you've got the capacity to put Drip at uh, two drips of water into it. It's not going to dilute it down. It won't make it. It won't make it crumble. But but yeah, it does. It palates palates well at forty six. It's um yeah. So that one did I tell you that that was the eleventh of October nineteen eighty nine. I did tell you that, didn't? Let's say uh, yeah, a good one. Lovely. Mm. Any questions from anyone? I'm just going to scroll back, make sure we're not missing anybody. I think we're on top of things pretty much, I believe. It's really in play, on the nose. <laughs> yeah. Yep, a little bit of furniture polish in there. Oh, I, Julie, one thing I know, I, you were talking about Rancio and that old and how it doesn't sound very nice. You yeah. know, um, and this, this goes back to when we were talking about the Ben Nevis and how fruity, especially the whiskeys from 95 and 96 are. Mm -hmm. um, Dan Soar at the Cotswolds Distillery probably summed this up best for me, talking about long fermentations and how that can create very fruity whiskeys. And he said, think about a banana. When does it smell its most fragrant? And it's yeah. literally when it's about to rot. Yeah. Um, when you're going to the very end of its yeah. edible life cycle is when it's at its fruitiest. Yeah. Taking it to the max. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, yeah, yeah, exactly. I think um, I think well, you know, to talk about the the elixir distillery, we are just on the brink of um, putting spades in the ground to start building our own distillery on Isla, and I think it will be really interesting to see the direction that they go in with the the style of whiskey that they're going to make. I think they'll be. Um, They'll be taking the all the good parts of all the whiskies that everybody really loves and and putting that to, to work in the distillery. Um, I think is a <laughs> I'm just sorry I'm just laughing at the comment is Lily Celine. There you go. You're not flying under the radar. <laughs> I mean, it's my alter ego. <laughs> I only like let her come out for evening tastings, middle of the night tastings. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Julie, you're, you're, well, we might as well just quick, quickly touch on it and we should probably start moving on to, because I, I also don't want to keep the two of you up too, too late tonight, um, the Ardmore 2009, but yeah, I, you know, there's a lot of us who are really excited about um, uh, Elixir's distillery opening on Isla eventually. Obviously, we're going to have to be patient and wait a while for, for, for whiskey, mature whiskey to come off of that. But, um, you know, my perspective, I have a lot of respect for everyone in the Elixir team, you know, especially Sikinder and uh, whom I personally consider a bit of a role model for, for my business and how I want to run my business. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think is kind of really interesting about him is that he seems to attract um, people uh, with a lot of talent and character. And he also manages to retain them, which I've always thought is a sign of a good boss. Like if, you know, you can be like, you know, smart and have great ideas and passion and vision, but if people don't want to work for you, that's a whole other thing. And I, you know, I'm really excited to see this happen because I think, you know, what he's done with the whiskey exchange and with Elixir Distillers and now a distillery is just really fascinating. And I've been watching slowly over the years as he picks off people here and there from different companies because he's obviously got to be a good person to work for yeah yeah they're a lovely company to work for um but yeah so it is it's an exciting time to be part of Alexa distillers definitely yeah 
it's um, we are all super excited about it. So I think um, <clears throat> at the and the, they keep referring to this summer. So <laughs> Georgie, Georgie starts with us. Georgie Crawford, who mm-hmm. was the distillery manager at Lagavulin, and um, she's been overseeing the reopening of the Portellan Distillery. Um, Georgie comes to work with us as the Elixir Distillers, eh, the, the distillery manager of Elixir Distillers. I th- we're going round and round in circles. They're still not named this distillery yet. So <laughs> they'll just keep referring to it as the distillery. But, you know, eventually we're going to need to call it something because folk are going to have to, you know, make reference to it. But Georgie... We have been asking for such a long time now. It's just like every week it keeps changing and, and going right. back and forth. Oh, yeah, yeah, we had names and then we would start to talk about it and then it'd be like no don't talk about that because that's no we're not doing that one and so it changed the list got longer and shorter on a weekly basis and we've still not reached the decision I think he's nearly there though but um I've heard that for a while <laughs> watch this space we may have a name before the distillery starts distilling you never know <laughs> Let me say that I'm, I'm busy saying out loud there that you know it won't be long but I've been there since 2019 and I've been talking about it since then I've been talking about it since 2014 to be fair so <laughs> Georgie starts with us on the 1st of July so that's when the the anticipation um of the summer starts um and our distillery will start so yeah I think um I think once it once it gets going it'll move quite quickly and it'll be really exciting for us all to, to see this starting to evolve. I personally can't wait. So I'm just really, Same. really excited to see it coming to life. Um, and in the best place in the world as well, on Isla. It's just wonderful. And it'll give everybody, if you've not been before, it'll give you a damn good reason to come and visit. Mm-hmm. Andrew, you needed another reason to come, I'm sure. Yeah, well, you know, that's the, I love Isla, but I don't really enjoy touring distilleries for the 20th time. Um, I used to have a whiskey tour company. I've seen them a lot. Um, So yeah, having a new reason to go there would be good because I love the island. I love the people. I love the food. Um, I love the weather, like especially when it changes in a a space of minutes from sunshine to absolute torrential downpour. It's just, it's a fascinating place. The color of the ocean, the green in the hills. It's just, I love Isla. So that was the first place I met you was on Isla. Yeah, I think so. You were were you um, selling Scotch Malt Whiskey Society bottles at that time? I was. I was a brand ambassador for Scotch That's Malt. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you were at Isla House, I think, with a Range Rover. That's right. Yeah, yeah long, all those years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably the second last time I was on Isla. That was that was Feshiel, I think, 20, 2015. <laughs> Yeah, the art figure. So yeah, I unfortunately don't get to Isla as often as I used to, but uh, but anyway, um, I as much as I hate to 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 step on the gas, but I think we, we should get on to these next two whiskeys because um, yeah, we're we're approaching 1:30 in the morning your time. So we've got two Ardmores now, one young, one old. And uh, together, then if we talk about these whiskies together, if that's all right, yeah, I think that makes sense. So, one of them, the first one that we're going to try, and um, whiskey number six is 10 years old, just as Andrew said there, and then drum seven is, is 20 years old. So, from the, the video games. Sorry, that's my, that's my mind starting to close down. You said it's 1.30 in the morning and my brain went, what? <laughs> oh, that's, that's my fault then. I'm, I'm triggering that, so. Um, so the, the video games one is the 10 years old. Um, so this one is 59% ABV. So I think that's definitely the punchiest one that we've got. Um, this one was, it was distilled on the 1st of December, 2009. And this one was matured in a single barrel that had previously, so in its previous, just before life, it was a first fill Laphroaig barrel. So it was a first fill bourbon Laphroaig barrel. And then we got in, then we got it, then Ardmore got it. So Ardmore is owned by Beam Centauri, as is Laphroaig. And these days, 
Ardmore spirit is matured in ex Lafroyd casks. Um, not the case for the 20 year old. The 20 year old um, was a single hoggy. This was prior to the, the, um, the start of putting the, the whiskey into Lafroyd casks. The drum number seven is 51.4. So quite quite a difference, but I think it's interesting to do these two side by side. One is double the age, um, and you can definitely see so two different cast types, but they would both originally have been in you know in their original state. They would have been bourbon barrels, so there's no sherry. Well, the the young one may, is making me think of barbecue, like barbecue brisket, hickory smoke, um, and I think. Even though it's been in that Isla barrel, I think you can um, you can see a bit of, or you can see a bit of that Highland style of peat, which is quite different from an Isla peat, yeah. um, where you don't have that medicinal character. But then again, there's going to be residual traces of that medicinal yeah. Lafroy character from the Lafroy cask. Yeah. And I think I, I do think it comes through. You know, like I do think the Lafroy character does come through in the Ardmore when you taste the twenty year old. Now with the fact that it's had an extra 10 years in cask. Um, it's not got, just as you see, it's still got coastal notes, but it's not got the, that kind of Lafroig. I want to see. It's subtle, but it just gives you that extra bit of kind of medicinal smokiness that you would get from a Lafroig cask. Really interesting. And I think that's one of the reasons why Ollie would have selected that to go into the whiskey trail, because it's not your typical Ardmore. So it's got a lot of the Ardmore character, but it's got something else. And you, we couldn't bottle this as an Ardmore single malts of Scotland because it's just a little bit too different from your traditional Ardmore. So we love this. And I think Ollie selected it because it was so unique. And that's why he decided to bottle it under the whiskey trail range. So it's something a little bit different. And these are the typical examples of what we like to bottle under the whiskey trail label is just things that we couldn't really get away with under the more official range. So this is like the fun part of the, the business. And this is why we can go crazy with the labels as well, because the whiskeys are a little bit crazy too, but really tasty all the same. It's the fun younger sibling, isn't it? The, yeah. the, we get to have fun with this one. But, um, I think Underneath, you know, the, the 10 year old, I think is, is it's really complex because underneath that heat and smoke and that kind of floral note you're getting, you're getting a real vanilla flavor coming through as well. And a caramelly flavor. I don't know if this is, you know, taking things back all the way to where those bourbon barrels would have come from before, but Obviously, Lefroy and Ardmore are both owned by Jim Beam or, well, Beam Suntory, which um, don't get me started on that because I don't know why Suntory put Beam in charge of the company, but I digress. Um, but I always get a note of shelled peanuts in Beam bourbons, and I'm getting a little bit of that in here. So it's almost like I can taste through the Ardmore and Lefroy all the way back to Jim Beam bourbon. It's interesting that you get a characteristic look at though. It is there. It's it's great, and I'm going to go back to the kind of tropical note again. If you smell under the smoke, sometimes I think, I think my we deal with Isla whiskey all the time, and I think my my senses are dulled to peat, and I can smell like you know, I don't think this smells particularly peaty. The ten year old. It's really no, but I th I think for me it's more of that like again, like barbecued, like meat, like grilled brisket, like barbecue brisket or like pork ribs kind of note coming off on the nose. I'd like to point out uh, Jake's tasting note actually, because as soon as he said it, that's what I fled with. And it's bacon and maritime. It's like a very oh. specific Canadian reference, but as soon as I got transported to eating bacon at my friend's place in the Maritimes, <laughs> Two years ago and I was like oh my god <laughs> so very accurate tasting note I found anyways I like tasting that like when that. I come over to Canada that's on my to-do list Andrew we'll, we'll have <laughs> some bacon in maritime 
Well, there's this is this is beef country in Canada. We're a little ways from the ocean, but we we get seafood delivered here by air usually. Um, but yeah, we have like good good steaks, good like barbecue places. There's this this is where you come for the meat. Um, if you want good seafood, you got to hit the Maritimes. Um, Halif Halifax is your, probably your destination for that. Right, I'll come for the meat. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Come to the meat side. I'm going to open these small screens again for the 20 year old. <laughs> That's what I'm getting. It's almost so with chonka beans. I think they're almost like frangipan. Coffee and frangipan inside of a bakewell tart. And this 20 year old is, yeah, it's creamy and cakey almost. It um, <laughs> reminds me of like, um like fresh whipped cream. Um, yeah. There's almost something that reminds me of something very Scottish, but like Kranakin on the nose, like fresh yeah. berries, um, mm -hmm. whipped hoppy, maybe a bit of granola. I was gonna say pavlova, it reminds me of pavlova because it's got that creaminess and that sweetness from the meringue, but it's like, I see the Kranakin now, it's got a bit of maltiness as well. Oatiness. Well, now that, we're, now that we're talking desserts, now I'm thinking of Napoleon, like again, thinly sliced pastries, vanilla cream, Maybe some berry fruits on top. Yeah, that's I lovely. That. I was, um, so as I said earlier, when I, I'm one of the organizers of Glasgow's Whiskey Club. Recently, I was doing a tasting with them first, and then I was doing a middle of the night tasting with someone. So I was on with them. So I wasn't, they were all dramming all night, and I was just smelling and sipping things. And, um, and one of the guys is an absolutely avid Ardmore fan. Like, it's a thing that I, you know, I haven't found very many of. There's a couple of them in my whiskey club, though, that are avid Ardmore fans. And he was telling me that apparently they have, they have replicated, dip, so they're a distillery that's obviously quite superstitious about the liquid, and they have replicated dents and bangs in the line arm and the the stills, you know, for, to keep that consistency. I don't know how accurate that is, like whether that's true or not, but apparently they've done that at Ardmore. Well, that, um, that's a rumor you hear at a lot of distilleries. Um, that, I wonder you whether know, it's a kitten clap trap or whether it is actually true. Like, you know, with somebody specifically banging a, a <laughs> into a still, but- um, It's the ghosts in the distilleries. They're just keeping the distilleries going. That's, That's right. right. That's right. Absolutely. Well, speaking of the Glasgow Whiskey Club, uh, we had Brian Simpson on last night hosting an Ardbeg uh, tasting for us. So another another good Glasgow boy. He is indeed. He runs a he runs a whiskey club called the Hip Flask Hiking Club, and they are the <laughs> baddest whiskey club that I have ever dealt with. They are absolutely insane, and I love doing tastings for them. They're properly bonkers. They're great. Um, really good fun. That seems they, about right. Where they write a tasting note for every whiskey, they use breakout rooms and they come back in and they produce a tasting note for every whiskey that they're drinking and it's really, really good fun. They're a great crowd. But yeah, fries good. Good value. What are we thinking of the, do, does anyone have a favourite between the two of the 10 year old and the 20? Is everyone going to go for the 20? Just that kind of Hands down, okay. I really like the 10 as well, though. I think. Yeah, Julie, I'm with you on that. Like the, the 20 is nice, mm -hmm. it's elegant, but um, I don't know, maybe that's the craving for I, you know, we had Ardbeg last night, so maybe my palate's craving a bit more, yeah, a bit more peat. But the they're both good, but I, I think the you know, the, the younger one has just got a lot of a lot of things going on with it, yeah. I like the, the 10 with a little bit of water added. I find it a little bit too hot at 59. So I just added a few drops of water and it really helps. Like it's quite peaty. It brings out quite a lot of the peatiness with the water, but it really helps with the, the alcohol. I really enjoy it. Like. Yeah, it's great. We, I did a, an Ardmore tasting years ago and they had, he brought along, the distillery manager did the tasting for us and he brought along this tree of case of, miniatures and it was called Ardless and it 
completed Ardmore. I think they call it Ard Lair now, but this was the yeah. very first time they had done it. This is this is quite a long time ago, but Ardless, and it was absolutely brilliant. It was really, really interesting and interesting to get the distillery character with a different, you know, a different style on it. It was um, it was good. I've got a book down there. He brought his books with him. Um, and it's, yeah, it was a great night. Yeah, the uh, I'm going to try adding some water to my story. I'm just getting the SKUs ready to share so that if anyone's interested in any of these bottles, I'll give you the pricing and uh, share a link with you for each of the SKUs. Unfortunately, I don't have the bottle shots up for these yet, but I'll have those up at some point tomorrow. Um, but yeah, I've added a drop of water to both. And I hate to use this term, but it shook the the 20 year old loose. I don't like it when people say water opens whiskey up because it just, it oversimplifies things and it's actually not what's happening. Um, but it did shake something loose on the, the, the older one on the nose, which I liked. Um, yeah. I think there's more vanilla in the nose of the 20 now that I've, I did the same, I added a couple of drops of water. And on the palate, the palate is more lush there's a this nice clean elegant smoke in there, um, and you know some light citrus fruits hiding underneath it. Um, mm. The water did take the edge off a bit on the the younger one. Not in a bad way. Though. I think it's still yeah. on the twenty. The the twenty is almost a bit kind of creamy herbally flavor going on. It's I get mm. shortbread myself. Oh, the mm. little bit of water added, I get that yeah. sharp, really nice. Yeah, I don't know, it's a kind of green hair, but I don't know quite what. Yes, I can indeed, Tim. But... Yeah, sure. Just have a uh, question in the chat from Tim. Uh, he's wondering if we are able to share the slide um, and tasting notes from tonight. Um, whether yeah, so, we... so the good news there is the tasting notes are on our website um, and the photos will also be up there tomorrow. I, I don't have the, uh, the time to get them formatted and put on there tonight, but all of the details, so the cask type, all of that will be up on the website. Um, well, there, it's up there now. Um, and I'm going to start sharing the different inventory um, links so that people can see them. So maybe this is actually a good time to just quickly go through them one at a time. I can give you the pricing, um, share the link in the chat, starting with the Glen Elgin, um, which uh, retails for $98, which is pretty good price for a, a single cast Scotch whiskey. Also, for taking part in tonight's tasting, we're happy to give you a 10% discount. So if you place your order online, just put a memo in the, the memo field. Um, I took part in last night's uh, whiskey trail tasting and we'll give you a discount. It doesn't apply automatically online. Our website's not intelligent enough for that, which is why we're launching a new one um, in the next few weeks, um, which is partly why I will not have a lot of time to do much else but uh, that's coming. So the canvas, the next one is two and a quarter. Uh, so 225, which for a 30 year old uh, grain is a, again, or 29 year old grain is a pretty good price. Um, and I think we can all agree it was a lovely, a lovely whiskey. So there's the link for that. Um, next, we tried the Ben Nevis, um, which, you know, of all the whiskeys we had tonight, this definitely has a cult following behind it. Um, it is 280 for the Ben Nevis. Um, it's hard to come by Ben Nevis these days. I don't think we have a ton of this, but um, again, participants in tonight's tasting will get first crack at them. And, you know, without trying to seed demand or anything like, uh, just quickly going back to that, I, that's my favorite whiskey of the night. I, the Glen Rothis is probably a close second um, and not just because these are old or expensive, but I just, I love how fruity that Ben Nevis is, uh, nose and palate. I, I love that distillery. It's, um, it was underappreciated for a long time. Unfortunately, it's not anymore. I think the secret's out that 
Paul Ben Nevis is good. Ollie's fault is releasing some yeah. amazing Ben Nevis. <laughs> just don't tell anyone. Just everybody keep it a secret. There's, there's yeah. any 47 of us in here. We're in the cone of silence. So yeah. we'll try to represent that. Um, Invergordon up next, 235, 32 year old single grain. Again, a great price. Um, uh, the priciest whiskey in tonight's tasting is the Glenrothes, um, 30 year old single malt. Um, having said that, um, you know, it's hard to find 30 year old single cast single malts um, under this anymore. This is 430 per bottle. Um, so the link for that is there as well too. Um, and if you search on our website, just search whiskey trail, don't put the whiskey trail in there, just search whiskey trail. You should be able to pull up all of the whiskeys, um, not just right now, but after tonight's tasting, because the SKUs are going to remain live on the website now that the tasting's done because this was really the opportunity to highlight um, this brand. We wanted to kind of do a launch for it because we've never had this here before. And, you know, we were curious about these too. This was just an excuse to open seven bottles of whiskey and find out what they really taste like, which I think makes the best tastings. Absolutely. Would you like me to show you a sneak preview of the ones that are coming? Please do. These, uh, so this is Lily's least favourite and it's my absolute favourite. I love these labels. So they are based on country and Western concert posters. I have in my possession Loretta Linearm, who is the bottom left. Um, it's a 21-year-old Glenburgy. Um, I just love these labels. I think they're super cool. They're really... <laughs> Yeah, they're Tammy Washback. Those who've been making their way across to Canada, you won't be getting the blended malt because uh, we are imported. Didn't think the name was appropriate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are you kidding? <laughs> you, you, no, <laughs> no. But that was a, an interesting discussion. <laughs> what? So, what's the blended malt called? It's Jerry Lee Lauter. Why is that not okay? Well, the association with Jerry Lee Lewis presumably wasn't quite politically correct enough for. We were forgetting about Kensington Wine Market, Lily. That's yeah. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to to talk to Michelle about that because I love those random blended malts. Like, because yeah. is it sherry? It's don't tell me. It's, it is. It is. Yeah. Uh -huh. But don't worry, don't worry, watch this space. There might be another blended malt cherry coming up after that. Okay. That will not have a controversial name, hopefully. <laughs> I just I just wanted to show you the, the labels, that you see the difference in them. So we had the Roaring Twenties, Vintage Cars, then we had video games. Now we've got Country and Western concert posters. Um, uh, I love these labels. <laughs> awesome. I just love it. It's brilliant. It's got they would... Uh, Brilliant. They would do really well in, in Calgary just because we are definitely more of a country music themed. Yeah. Um, but there is a local music theme called the Blue Jay Sessions, which are all local uh, country singer songwriters. Um, right. And they would just that it was very reminiscent of the posters that those guys made, too. Yeah. I'm, so. I'm so Lily, please tell me that the 19 year old blended malt's not all sold out yet. I'll check for you. Just hold on to a little bit of it. We'll see what we can do about that. But I think we can start maybe chatting a bit more about a slightly more provocative, but not offensive because of it being named after someone sort of concept, which I think I think could be fun. Yes, most definitely. I'm sure we yeah. can come up with something really exciting for you guys. All right. Absolutely. Um, and if the first label has a has a fellow ludicrously playing polo from the back of an elephant all the better. I was just going to say um, I'm so so keen about the elephant polo labels they're just well, and, and Julie there's there's a story behind this as all of the inside even the urinating on the Duke of Sutherland's monument there's a story behind that yes I can imagine um, <laughs> which is when I first told Sam my idea for that he called me at 1 30 in the morning in the UK because he had done the same thing the same year that I had. And it was like this shared experience. So anyway, it's never just crass to be crass. It's- I was just going to say- Edgy to tell a story. 
we put you and Simmons in the same room, these things are going to happen. That's, That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, so before we start winding down, and if anyone has any last questions that they want to ask Julie or Lily before we let them, um, I guess, end yesterday for, for themselves so that they yeah. can start tomorrow or later. Um, I do want to just quickly um, uh, talk about tonight's tasting because, because of the support of Pacific Wine and Spirits, which is an incredible partner for us, um, helping with the cost of a number of the products in the tasting. Um, we're going to be cutting a check on Monday to the Brenda Strafford Society, which is a second stage women's shelter in Calgary that our store has been supporting through various different activities for the last four years. Um, so I want to say a huge thank you to um, Bernadette, who's on tonight, but also Michelle, who's not, because she's camping and enjoying her, her summer long weekends. Um, because it's through their generosity that that's possible. So thank you to them for that. If anyone's curious, um, if you're ever looking for a good cause to support, I highly recommend the, the Brenda Strafford Center uh, or Foundation. They have a number of different um, uh, uh, parts of their organization, but the one to me that's incredibly meaningful is their second stage women's shelter. It's a place for women to go to start um, transitioning out of living in a shelter so that they can find the security to find employment, find a place to live, and hopefully, you know, have a better life, often with children. And the most touching thing to me about visiting this place was that oftentimes they just, they don't have basic necessities like shampoo, feminine hygiene products, you know, people, they, they can't accept dented cans of food, which is nuts, but like, they need all these basic things that a lot of us take for granted. So it's a great organization. Highly recommend you look into it, uh, you know, either in Calgary or in your own community to make sure that these organizations are supported. So thank you for that. Um, all of the whiskeys I mentioned are now live on our website. So if you do wanna place an order again, um, you can search whiskey trail or you can click on the links that are in that chat, but keep in mind that chat feed is going to disappear just as soon as we uh, end the feed here tonight. So if you just search whiskey trail on our website, they should all come up and photos will be posted in there tomorrow. Um, Julie and Lily, again, thank you very much for staying up late for us to join us. Lily, this is two, week, two weeks in a row. So um, <laughs> a, a, an extra special thank you to I you for that. I think we should do that every week, Andrew. It's just uh, like, it's just great. <laughs> I'm, I'm not only saying this because she's an earshot, but I'm pretty sure that would lead to divorce. Um, <laughs> but no, it's been great. And actually, I think one of the cool things about the COVID uh, opportunity for tastings through these virtual events is it's given us the ability to connect with people like yourselves in a different part of the world, but also has been able to allow customers of ours from across the country to take part too. Um, so, you know, before if people from Ontario or Quebec wanted to, to take part in a Kensington tasting, they had to fly to Calgary. Um, now they just need to, to log into to Zoom or whatever it is we end up using moving forward. So that's awesome. Um, Julie, Lily, any, any parting, uh, parting comments or advice for people? I don't know about the advice, but uh, it was really nice to come on and see you all tonight. <laughs> I don't I definitely don't have advice for you. Never take advice from me. It's definitely. Yeah, I would say the same about me, to be fair. We've got <laughs> really good advice. Don't take my advice. <laughs> but no, thank you so much. I see some of you guys were already on the tasting last week. So thank you for coming back. It's great. And really hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Andrew, for organizing this, for doing all the sample bottles and sending those out. Thank you to Pacific for the donation. It's such a great cause and we're really, really happy that we're able to help in a little way. So it's been yeah, a fantastic evening once again. So I hope you enjoyed your, your drums and enjoy the rest of your weekend and your beautiful warmth that we do not have in Scotland at the moment. Yeah, allow you to put my heat on just for a wee. Yep. <laughs> you know, I remember the, the, the second last time I was there, it was in the middle of a heat wave and I think Scotland ran out of sunscreen. So Well, yeah, um, this happens sometimes. Not often, but it does yeah. happen. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, I suppose it goes without saying that I should should also say that I don't personally fill all these sample bottles 
Um, my staff do, in particular, one young man, David, it's kind of become his job and it's almost a full-time job now filling sample bottles for tasting. So we should probably acknowledge his hard work. And uh, Chelsea's also looking char is taking charge of events and things like that moving forward. So we're happy to have her. And incidentally, she did let me know that the, the QR codes for tonight's bottles don't work, but we've fixed that issue moving forward. So uh, we're all good on that front. Just search them on the website. But uh, Julie, Lily, uh, and everyone watching, I wanna say thank you again. Um, I hope you all have a great night. Um, we'll have more cool tastings coming up in the future. We have some amazing casks from Elixir coming this fall. So we'll definitely be uh, setting something up in terms of tastings uh, for the fall session when we know those products are gonna be here. Um, so stay tuned for that. But again, everyone, thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks for tuning in and we look forward to seeing you again. Cheers. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.